Senate Democrats kill two bills aimed at protecting babies in and outside the womb. After voting against both these bills, Senator Elizabeth Warren says it's bad to tell women to kill it when they're pregnant. Then a ridiculously common sense abortion bill in Louisiana gets a hearing before the Supreme Court, while the abortion cult shows up to worship and celebrate their abortions. Finally, AOC puts her self-delusion on full display, teaching us an important lesson about humanity. I'm Seth Gruber, and this is Unabortion. Welcome to Unaborted with Seth Gruber. Thanks for tuning in today. So it's been two weeks since we've looked at what's happening in the country. As last week, we had the interview with Chris and Hawkins, the president of Students for Life of America. And my goodness, these two last weeks have been a cornucopia of abortion-related news. And it's only March. The abortion industry and their serviles in the Democratic Party are only getting started in an election year, which poses significant moral and political threats to the ability of the abortion industry to operate and to continue to line their pockets with the blood money from killing children. So we're going to look at sort of a flyover view today of some of the things that have been happening in the last two weeks, as they're very important for the soul of our country and the lives of unborn children. But first, if you haven't given the show a rating and review yet, go and do that for us. That really helps us reach more people, expand the reach of the show, and combat the abortion trolls that troll my podcast and leave one-star reviews and nasty comments. So if you're on iTunes or somewhere else that enables you to leave a review, please do that for us. So a couple of weeks ago, Senate Democrats killed two bills that would have protected babies inside and outside the womb. And these are the Pain-Capable Unborn Child Protection Act and the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act. And Senate Democrats have actually killed both of these bills before. <laughs> they killed the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act last year, February of 2019, and the Pain-Capable Unborn Child Protection Act a couple years ago. And recently we talked about Doug Jones, the senator from Alabama, who laughed at that question. Do you think that we should ban abortions after five months? Well, that's 20 weeks. That's when the Pain-Capable Unborn Child Protection Act would have banned abortion. And he laughed at that and thought that was really funny because apparently it's, it's funny to allow any woman to kill any baby five months or older who can feel the full range of human pain that born people can. So both of these bills died last week as neither received the 60 votes necessary to overcome the filibuster, which is just atrocious, just disgusting. Senate Democrats have been opposed to late-term abortion bans for a long time, but their radicalism has grown so, so fully fledged that now they're not even willing to condemn infanticide. Two years in a row, the same bill. They've killed it both times. So the Pain-Capable Unborn Child Protection Act would have simply made abortions illegal after five months. The medical research and evidence suggests that really by 18 weeks and certainly by 20 weeks, the unborn child is able to feel the full range of human pain as if as a newborn or an infant or any other born person would. So on February 25th, Rachel Delgaitis from the Daily Signal broke down both of these cases and said that only two Democrats voted yes on the pain-capable Unborn Child Protection Act, that being Bob Casey of Pennsylvania and Joe Manchin of West Virginia. And actually one Republican voted against banning abortions after five months, and that's Susan Collins of Maine. We talked about Dr. Maureen Condict a couple weeks ago, who's a PhD associate professor of neurobiology and anatomy at the University of Utah, who in 2017 testified before Congress about new advances and information and research in the science of embryology pertaining to the ability of the fetus to feel pain. Here's what she said. Is it, it is entirely uncontested in the scientific and medical literature that a fetus experiences pain in some capacity from as early as eight weeks, meaning they respond to stimuli in some form. And most modern neuroscientists conclude that the thalamic circuitry that's in place by 18 weeks post-fertilization is primarily responsible for human experience of pain at all stages of life. We know this. This is largely uncontested now. The Pain-Capable Unborn Child Protection Act would have banned abortion for babies two weeks older than the stage of development that Dr. Maureen Condict says the child is fully capable of, of experiencing the full range of human pain. 20 weeks and later, it would have banned abortion. And only two Democratic senators voted in support of that bill. We can certainly hope and pray that they actually believe killing five plus month babies is wrong, but they also come from slightly more red states. And so they might just want to be, be 
appeasing their base and their constituency to get reelected. So that's the first bill that Senate Democrats Democrats killed, green lighting the painful limb tearing of unborn humans at five, between five months and nine months. Nope, we're not going to make that illegal. The Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act received basically the same exact votes that it did a year ago when Senator Ben Sass initially brought it up for a vote in response to Virginia Governor Ralph Northam's controversial and disgusting comments on a radio show when he was asked, well, what would you do with a baby that was born alive during a botched abortion? Well, I'll tell you what we do. We'd make the baby comfortable. We'd resuscitate the baby if that's what the mother wanted. And then the doctor and the mother would have a conversation, obviously alluding to the fact that perhaps they should be able to have a moral conversation about what to do with the baby already born. Should we just take care of it? Or should we just step back and not give any medical care to an infant and simply let it die? So this bill went 56-41, again, not receiving the 60 votes necessary to overcome the filibuster initiated by Democrats. Amy Klobuchar, Bernie Sanders, and Elizabeth Warren refused to vote on either bill. So not to speak is to speak. You're green lighting infanticide and late-term abortions by refusing to vote in support of protecting those babies, obviously. And the only Democrats to vote in favor were, again, Joe Manchin and Bob Casey and Doug Jones. And I need to correct something I said a couple weeks ago in the They Think Abortion is Funny episode. I mentioned that Doug Jones voted against the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act in 2019. He voted for it, but he voted against the Pain Capable Unborn Child Protection Act in 2018 and again in 2020. Obviously, he's pro-abortion. He's greenlighting painful late-term abortions, but he does vote in support of the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act because he comes from a redder state, Alabama, that tried to pass an abortion ban in 2019. And there's no way this dude's getting reelected if he doesn't vote in support of the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act. And he might not anyways after voting against the pain capable Unborn Child Protection Act. So here are your options. Here is your Democratic Party. And according to a Gallup poll in 2019, only 12% of Americans support abortion in the last three months, in the third trimester. If you're a Democratic senator and you refuse to even condemn infanticide, why why would you condemn late-term abortions? There's no moral reason as to why you would. And clearly, they didn't. Only two Democratic senators crossed the aisle to try to prevent the painful late-term limb tearing of unborn children. Now, the Democrats' defense as to why they're opposed to the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act is the same that it was in 2019, completely specious arguments. They say that, oh, well, we already have laws against infanticide. And this is hilarious, by the way, because when they voted down this bill in 2019, they also voted on a bill that received unanimous bipartisan support in the Senate, labeling lynching as a hate crime, despite the fact that it's illegal to kill people regardless of how you do it. (laughs) So you don't have to label lynching a hate crime for the legal repercussions to change. It's wrong to kill people regardless of how you do it. But they thought it was very important to label lynching a hate crime, despite the fact that we already have laws against murder. But they wouldn't apply that same reasoning to to this situation to condemn infanticide Because they said, well, we already have laws against infanticide. And so therefore, their argument is that the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act is a Trojan horse. It's a Trojan horse bill with a far-right anti-abortion goal. Despite the fact that nothing in the bill is about abortion, the only time I think the word comes up is when it refers to abortion survivors. Well, if if you survived an abortion, then you're no longer in the womb, so you can't medically be aborted. That would only be infanticide at that point. So Maisie Hirono, senator from Hawaii and a real piece of work, I mean, a real whack job, gets up amongst other Democratic senators to protest the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act and repeat the same lies and the same tropes that her and her political affiliates did last year when they killed this bill. Here's Maisie Hirono. Can already be charged and prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Let's be clear. The Senate isn't debating this legislation today because there is an epidemic of infanticide in this country. There is one. There is not one. (laughs) There isn't one. I can hardly say it because it's really not happening, and so therefore this bill is a a solution in search of a problem. Instead, we're indulging the majority's use of a false premise to inflame the public, shame women, 
and intimidate healthcare providers. When you strip away the ultra-conservative rhetoric, you're left with a very simple argument from supporters of this legislation, that the moral judgment of right-wing politicians in Washington, D.C. should supersede a medical professional's judgment and a woman's decision. Conservative politicians should not be telling doctors how they should care for their patients. Instead, women, in consultation with their families and doctors, are, the, are in the best position to determine their... Euphemisms, 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 euphemisms. She's talking about infanticide, folks. What a smooth-talking bag of scum. She's not talking about abortion. She's talking about infants who were already born. And she calls legislators who think it's wrong to kill infants after they're born just applying Republican conservative logic. Since when was it conservative logic to say, can we at least get on the bipartisan bus of saying let's not kill babies after they're born? Everything she says is in regards to an anti-infanticide bill. So she says, there's not an epidemic of infanticide. Okay, what if infanticide was happening four times a year and physicians were getting away with it? That's not an epidemic. Should we not pass a law to do that? Of course we should. Now, it's hard to actually get the statistics on infanticide because most states aren't even required to report their abortion statistics. So if the baby's born alive during a failed abortion, it's very easy for the physician to get away with infanticide. And as we'll talk about later, most states don't even have state laws in place requiring physicians upon threat of legal repercussions to provide medical care to infants who survive abortion. So Maisie Hirono says, this is about inflaming the public, shaming women, and intimidating healthcare providers. Intimidating healthcare providers by saying, don't kill infants? Yeah, then I guess I'm okay with intimidating healthcare providers by telling them if you kill infants, there's repercussions. And it's about shaming women. If Maisie Hirono thinks that it is <laughs> that we're shaming women by saying you should not be able, according to Ralph Northam, to have a conversation with your physician about murdering your infant after, you, after you're born, then that woman, along with all of her colleagues, is morally unqualified to be a senator. That is a disgusting bag of euphemistic soup. Then she, she accuses the motivations of her Republican colleagues of imposing the moral judgment of right-wing politicians by accusing them of suggesting that that judgment should supersede a medical professional's judgment. And then she says, and a woman's decision. A woman's decision to do what, you sicko? Kill an infant already born. That's what she's talking about. And she's twisting an anti-infanticide bill to try to make the American public think that this is an anti-abortion bill that's going to strip women from making decisions, according to her. I mean, this is sick stuff. And nearly every other Democratic senator that lambasted this bill and justified their no vote or their uh, not voting or voting no said basically all the same things. Alexander DeSanctis, the pro-life apologist, basically, who writes for the National Review and just crushes the abortion industry every other day with her articles, writes, most Democrats who opposed the legislation last time around claim that it is redundant or unnecessary, right? We already have laws against infanticide in this country. Pat Murray, Democrat from Washington, said last year on the Senate floor when she rejected SAS's request for unanimous consent to the legislation. This is a gross misinterpretation of the actual language of the bill that is being asked to be considered, and therefore I object. You object to banning infanticide and requiring medical care for babies who survive botched abortions, which is all that the bill does. But in fact, there is no existing federal law, and this is the sanctus, that requires doctors to provide medical care for infants who survive an abortion procedure. So yes, infanticide is federally illegal, but there's no federal laws in place requiring that doctors provide medical cares to infants who survive abortions. The Born Alive Infants Protection Act of 2002, which we've talked about on the show, established the terms person, human being, child, and individual in federal law to include every infant born alive, even after an abortion. But it instituted no, penal no penalties for physicians who neglect to care for such infants. So you can let them die, which is killing. <laughs> Letting die is killing if you leave an infant on the table and refuse to give them medical care. No one would insinuate that you just let your toddler die by not feeding them. No, no, you actually killed them. As of 2014, only 26 states 
mandated care for infants born alive after an attempted abortion. And those state laws can, of course, be changed. The Reproductive Health Act, enacted in New York in 2019 of January, explicitly repealed a statute that had extended all of the protections of state laws to children born alive during an abortion. So she's setting an example of where a state law was changed that removed mandated protections and medical care for babies who survived botched abortions. There you go. And here, here's your Democratic Party. By the way, not representative of most Democrats because that 2019 poll saying 12% of Americans support third trimester abortions, that's not, tw- that's not 12% of Democrats, that's 12% of Americans. And yet they, the representatives of that party, the senators, won't even condemn infanticide. So Ben Sass, in an extremely satisfying clip, blasts Senate Democrats as infanticidal apologists. And by the way, I get flack sometimes for saying that, you know, they're, that the Democratic Party are infanticidal apologists. Whoa, Seth, come on. That, that's hyperbolically unnecessary. That's very rude and offensive. Except I have reasons for the words that I use. I'm not saying that to be gratuitously offensive. If you can't condemn infanticide, and say, yeah, yeah, I'll vote bipartisan with the Republican white people I hate to at least protect the lives of babies after they're born, then you are an infanticidal apologist. You're defending infanticide and greenlighting and enabling vicious abortionists to complete the job that they failed to do prenatally and do it post-utero. So here is Ben Sass responding to his colleagues. And I believe right before They voted on this uh, two weeks ago in the last week of February. In public that what's actually happening in the floor today is probably that like last year, 44 Democrats are going to filibuster an anti-infanticide bill. There's nothing in the bill that's about abortion. Nothing. It's about infanticide. That's the actual legislation. And you got 44 people over there who want to hide from it and talking euphemisms about abortion because they don't want to defend the indefensible because you can't defend the indefensible. We're talking about killing babies that are born. That's the actual legislation we're voting on today in the Senate. That's what the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act is. Is it okay in the eyes of the United States Senate for us to say, well, you can't actively kill the little baby. You can't take a pillow and put it over her face and smother her to death but you can back away and kill her that way. That's exactly right. Letting die is killing. Refusing to give medical care is a form of killing. And currently we don't have any federal laws in place that say you can't let them die. You can't just step away and refuse to care for infants after they're born because their mother said that they were unwanted in the womb. And making a six inch journey through the birth canal doesn't confer personhood or value, obviously. So if they're still unwanted after they complete that six inch journey, And that's where human value comes from. Why not kill them afterwards? They're still unwanted. And that's exactly what Ralph Northam meant. We should protect the rights of families to make these decisions. That's what Maisie Hirono was saying. We shouldn't be intruding into the decisions that healthcare providers make and the choices that women make. You infanticidal apologists and Ben Sass hits the nail right on the head. So let's ask why. Because this is this is this is rank evil. I mean, this is evil like we haven't seen coming from Democrats since they were, uh, oh, yeah, the party of slavery. This is, some of the, this is some of the most politically motivated evil that we have ever seen. Why would Senate Democrats ignore the clear lack of laws that Ben Sass cites requiring states to provide medical cares to babies born alive during failed abortions? Why would they ignore his comments After reading the entirety of the bill and pointing out that there's nothing in here that restricts a woman's legal right to get an abortion, there's nothing in the flipping bill about restricting abortion. It's about requiring medical care for babies who survive abortions. And they still label that as an anti-abortion Trojan horse that will somehow strip women of their reproductive health care. I think the answer as to why is found in our good friend, Robert P. George, and his his brilliant approach to natural law and to the value of incremental legislation like this that plants moral premises in the law that will eventually lead to the protection of all life. Now, Robert P. George, he's actually written on abortion. He wrote a book on abortion. He's a professor at the Princeton University. And here's what he had to say about 
why what Ben Sass is doing is valuable. Now, he's not responding to the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act, but it gets to the debate regarding incremental pro-life legislation like this. He says that, quote, planting premises in the law whose logic demands in the end full respect for all members of the human family can be, can be a valuable thing to do, even where those premises seem modest. Yeah, it seems pretty modest <laughs> to pass an anti-infanticide bill. It's a pretty modest proposition. Why are the Democrats so afraid of the modest proposition that we shouldn't kill in, uh, we shouldn't kill infants after they're born? Because I think that Senate Democrats are smart enough to realize that if they condemn infanticide right after the baby is born, it becomes morally untenable to suggest that the mother should still have the right to get an abortion seconds, minutes, hours, or a day before the baby is born. Because anyone with a semi-functioning moral compass or prefrontal cortex would have to agree and admit that if it's wrong to kill the baby seconds after it leaves the birth canal, it's certainly wrong to do so seconds before it comes out of the birth canal. And that's why such a low percentage of people support third trimester abortions, particularly abortions where the mother's dilating about to give birth. So you see, even though it's not a bill restricting abortion, it's planting moral premises in the law that in the end will demand the full respect of all human life, of all members of the human family. I think Robert P. George gets that exactly right. And I think these infanticidal apologists disguised as Democratic senators understand that. And that's why they're so afraid of it. So they're willing to literally enable vicious abortionists to murder infants in order to maintain their political philosophy and their abortion ideology. The Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act might plant logical premises in the law that would eventually demand we respect the unborn child. In turn, abortion would be decreased and limited. And above all else, that is the most unacceptable premise to the abortion industry and their cronies and serviles in the Democratic Party. Nothing can limit or restrict a woman's right to get an abortion at any point of the pregnancy, period. Anything that threatens that, even if it's a law speaking to the treatment of life after birth, will be rejected by the Democratic Party for that reason. So in a second, we're going to turn to Elizabeth Warren, who voted against or refuses to vote to protecting life in the womb or outside the womb, and some very strange comments that she had to say regarding the badness of abortion after green lighting and protecting the killing of babies. But first, we're offering a new feature here at Unaborted. Starting next week, I'll be taking your questions on the show. Anything relating to abortion, to the debate in our culture, to politics, to culture, feel free to email in and ask your questions and we'll start tagging those on towards the end of the show. So to get your questions answered, simply email your question to unaborted at sethgruber.com. That is unaborted at sethgruber.com and we'll be right back with a whole lot more. Welcome back to Unaborted. So Elizabeth Warren, one of the abortion hacks and infanticidal apologists whose presidential campaign recently just erupted into flames, and that's entirely satisfying, of course, refused to vote on either bill, the Pain Capable Unborn Child Protection Act or the Born Alive uh, Abortion Survivors Protection Act. And of course, I mean, you're just helping the process, of course. So she refused to vote last year. She refused to vote again on, the, on this this year, um, which... Of course, we know how pro-abortion she is, so she's perfectly fine with killing these babies both before or after they're born. But what was particularly ghoulish and disgusting as an example of where the party's going and the seemingly intellectual consistency of the abortion rights movement. Actually, what I mean by that is there's no reason to stop supporting the killing of babies after they're born because if their value is based on their wantedness or their dependency, they could still be unwanted and they're still dependent as infants – Meaning if you consistently apply pro-choice ideology, it always justifies the killing of people after they're born. But pro-abortion activists have never been intellectually consistent. They've arbitrarily said humans have value at birth and we don't want to kill those babies. But in a, in a, in a move of seemingly intellectual consistency, they're now greenlighting infanticide. And yet reality has an annoying tendency of reasserting itself in our lives, as I'm fond of saying. Reality tends to be self-evident, particularly on moral issues. And abortion is one of the most deeply immoral issues ever, the killing of a child, the killing of a defenseless baby. 
hours after green lighting five plus month painful abortions by refusing to vote in support of the Pain Capable Unborn Child Protection Act or the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act, Elizabeth Warren on February 25th goes after Michael Bloomberg in the Democratic presidential debates. And she repeats, repeats this lie that she's been telling for a long time that she was fired for being pregnant as a 20-something. And we actually have interviews of her from years ago saying that, well, no, I just chose to go be a mom. I chose to go mother the baby. And so I wasn't fired for being pregnant. But she's been lying about the saying it was pregnancy discrimination. So during the debates, she says this line. And then she says, well, at least I didn't have a boss who told me to kill it, which allegedly a woman has said that Michael Bloomberg has said. So here's here's Elizabeth Warren tr- uh, seeming to insinuate that it's bad to tell people to kill their babies hours after saying we should protect the rights of people to kill their babies. When I was 21 years old, I got my first job as a special education teacher. I love that job. And by the end of the first year, I was visibly pregnant. The principal wished me luck and gave my job to someone else. Pregnancy discrimination, you bet. But I was 21 years old. I didn't have a union to protect me. and I didn't have any federal law on my side. So I packed up my stuff and I went home. At least I didn't have a boss who said to me, kill it. The way that uh, Mayor Bloomberg never alleged said that. have said to one of oh, his come on. pregnant employees. So hours after saying we should protect the rights of people to kill babies through all nine months of pregnancy for any reason or no reason at all because their childs are not wanted. And also enabling physicians to have conversations with mothers about whether to kill infants that are unwanted. Elizabeth Warren turns around and insinuates that it would be bad, that it would be a moral wrong to tell a woman to kill it if she's pregnant. And the way she sets up this scenario, right, this story is that while it was bad for me as Elizabeth Warren to endure pregnancy discrimination, which we know is a lie, because I was deprived of a right to a career that I already had because I was pregnant, while that was bad, at least I didn't have a boss who told me to kill it like Mayor Bloomberg was alleged to have said. So what she's saying, she's saying it would be increasingly worse if I was told by my employer to kill the child in the womb as opposed to me just being fired by it. She's obviously insinuating that what she experienced wasn't as bad, hence the words, at least I wasn't told. (laughs) So question, Elizabeth Warren, it's bad then? It would have been bad if someone told you or asked you to kill your child in the womb? Oh, right, because you wanted that child. And we have you on tape in 2007 in an interview saying that you you went home because you wanted to be a mother, despite the fact that the school that you said fired you actually offered to renew your contract for the following year. So obviously, she's a liar. We know this. She's using this as a political stunt. But she's admitting that it would have been wrong to tell someone to kill it when you're pregnant. But you just voted to protect the rights of other parents to kill their children. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So what does this mean? Elizabeth Warren believes that one's value and right to life is based on their wantedness. She wanted her child. Therefore, it would have been morally atrocious for someone to tell her to kill it. But we're going to protect the rights of other families to kill their own children at the same stage of development or significantly more developed than your child who you alleged you were fired for being pregnant with. Welcome to the utilitarianism of leftist ideology. If you can provide something to me, you live. If not, you die. This is the world of the left, a purely utilitarian approach to humanity. And because unborn children, very generally, pose career threats, financial threats, educational threats, or convenience threats to their parents, then they're not fitting the utilitarian worldview of their parents, so therefore they can be killed. Clearly what Elizabeth Warren believes about babies. And it is telling as to where the party is going and where the culture is going. So next we're going to examine the first abortion-related lawsuit that has made it to the Supreme Court since the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh. And this is this Louisiana law that you probably heard about. I mentioned it on the show a couple months ago that would require that abortionists have admitting privileges at a local hospital in order to continue their practice. 
So these would be medical requirements for abortionists that would have to have admitting privileges at a local hospital or they couldn't continue to operate at their clinic. But first, if you like the show and want to hear more great content and commentary from the front lines of the abortion wars, then head on over to patreon.com slash unaborted. Uh, Greg Cunningham, one of the leaders of the pro-life movement, once said that there's more people working full-time to kill babies than there are working full-time to save them. And we're starting to see that change a little bit. More people are waking up. But unfortunately, one side makes a lot of money on the killing of babies, and the other side spends a lot of money trying to save babies. And the only money they really make is usually from fundraisers because they're not providing the killing of children in exchange for cash. And so we need your help, and we need to expand this message to reach more people. So if this has been valuable to you, you want to share this with young people in your life, with those who disagree with you, then consider becoming a patron of the show, going to patreon.com slash unaborted, and we'll be right back with a whole lot more. Hey guys, this is a cliffhanger. Unfortunately, we ran out of time today. So if you want to learn more about exactly what is happening with the Louisiana law that the Supreme Court is observing to determine whether to require abortionists to have admitting privileges to therefore protect the health and lives of women and about the protests happening on the steps of the Supreme Court where the abortion serviles and crazies are praising and celebrating and honoring their dead children for the life they've been able to create in America. And if you want to hear more about AOC saying that y'all are religious bigots using bigotry to justify your pro-life or uh, anti-immigrant positions while she herself is a bigot against unborn children, then tune back in next week to hear a whole lot more on what's going on in the culture, what's going on in the country, and what's going on in the front lines of the pro-life movement. We'll be right back next week with a whole lot more. I'm Seth Gruber, and this is Unaborted.